I apologize for being late. Um, nothing like being in the ladies' room and getting uh, an emergency text from your son back in California with something that needs to happen right this minute revolving um, around high school graduation in three weeks. So I apologize. All right. Reconvene for the open meeting. Do I need to have a roll call? Yes. All right. Roll call. We need a motion to reconvene. Oh, do I hear Make a motion? motion? So moved. Sorry. Second. Second. Trustee Dianger? Yes. Trustee Ciccone? Yes. Trustee Bailey? Here. Trustee Davis? Here. Trustee Dolce? Yes. Trustee Ellis? Yes. Trustee Valentin? Here. Trustee Worthington? Yes. Trustee Moreno? Yes. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> so, because I am off my game a little bit, Susan, what's our first? Order of business. The initial order of business is the public hearing on the proposed fee, tuition and fees for fiscal year 18. Uh, this can be, uh, an this provides an opportunity for the campus community to weigh in on the fee structure that appears in um, the board materials, um, the housing costs, etc. Uh, we do not finalize tuition until we get the final appropriation in July, but this does give individuals an opportunity um, to speak or address the issues related to housing costs, fee costs. Uh, Vice President Ingram um, is the individual who presents it, uh, and I ask that he do that at this time. So just to clarify, thank you, Mr. President, just to clarify, the public meeting is to receive input from the public on the tuition uh, so that the board can receive your comments so when they are in deliberation on the tuition, then we can uh, have informed material to make an informed discussion. Um, the board does not talk about tuition right now at this time. Um, we can go in. Uh, we have the fees material in the finance committee that uh, Trustee Ellis will review. Um, is that, is that the, mm -hmm. what you, yeah. So we would open it up for the public input on tuition setting. That concludes my report. No, okay. <laughs> that concludes Thank the public. That concludes so the public hearing. One, two, three, four. You won't take it anymore. Five, six, seven, eight. Why won't you negotiate? One, two, three, four. We won't take it anymore. Five, six, seven, eight. Why won't you negotiate? All right. So our next order of business: oath of office with Dr. Nancy Taggart-Davis, and she's our newly elected Board of Trustee member. And Harvey's going to introduce I, her. I want to give some background before we jump up, all okay? Right. Um, and all of you know that one of the things we had discussed about two years ago was the need to have a former faculty member on the Board of Trustees, and we're doing that today. We were able to do so, and I'm honored and pleased that she accepted our recommendation to the governor. Uh, for those who do not know her, um, Nancy Davis was appointed to our board on March 13th, uh, replacing former trustee Emma Byrne, who has returned to the Florida area, and she's living there. She's Professor Emerita of Pathology at Stockton, where she taught from 1973 to 2015. She served as Dean of Professional Studies uh, we, had a, we had a division called Professional Studies at one time from 1984 to 1987. She now serves, for those who do not know, as mayor of Long Beach Island uh, since 2015 and previously served beginning in 2010 as a council person and as president of the borough council. She holds a PhD from the University of Miss, uh, Pennsylvania where she majored in comparative pathology. She has a BS in biology and theater arts so she has that commitment to the liberal arts from Rollins College in Winter Park, Florida, which is not a bad place to be. Nancy has been dedicated to Stockton uh, throughout her history. I personally can attest, I don't know how many open houses we used to do together for years. Uh, she's a terrific um, representative, ultimately, of the voice of the faculty. Uh, she added substantially to our discussions today uh, in closed session, 
I could not be more pleased to be able to present, formally present to her to you. Um, she's really a wonderful human being, and we are fortunate she is now about ready to be sworn in as a member of our trustees. So, Dr. David, Madam Chair. Who, who would ever think that we would be here today because um, Dr. Davis was also one of my professors <laughs> long ago. Long Isn't ago. that, it's very, um, it's very moving to have you here, Thank stand you. next to you. Okay, so follow me. Okay. I, well, I try and do it in little chunks. Sometimes I'm more successful than other times, as you know. Right. I, Nancy Taggart Davis. I, Nancy Taggart Davis. Do solemnly swear do swell, solemnly swear that I will support the Constitution of the United States. That I will support the Constitution of the United States. And the Constitution of the State of New Jersey. And the Constitution of the State of New Jersey. And that I will bear true faith and allegiance. And I will bear true faith and allegiance. To the same to the same and to the governments established in the United States and to the governments established in the United States and in this state and in this state under the authority of the people under the authority of the people so help me God so help me God Yes. Uh, well, I, I appreciate all of you being here. <laughs> I know you came out just for this occasion. <laughs> I, I, I am very, very honored uh, in this position. It, it's probably the greatest honor I've ever had. Uh, I, I truly love Stockton. Uh, I, I learned, Stockton taught me so much. I might have taught a lot of students, but I learned from all of you, my colleagues, uh, my friends and administration, uh, my colleagues, so many of whom have retired. And it's so exciting for me to see the momentum that's going on here at the college. So for 40 some, 41 years, uh, I, I saw the college grow. And it was an exciting experience being part of a, a new college that was evolving. But I really think the next 40 years, hope I'll be there, uh, <laughs> <laughs> basically is even going to be more exciting. I think Stockton is making tremendous progress, and I think the reason is because we have such an am amazing faculty, an administration and faculty that work together. But my colleagues, I'm so honored because I respect all of you so much, and I feel very honored because I know a lot of you are a lot smarter than me. But thank you so much. Thank you. have to get her to officially sign the document. Um, moving on to chairperson's report, I am going to just hand it right over to Dr. Kesselman for the president's report. And in the, in, and in the interest of time, uh, and in respect the fact that many of you may want to have the opportunity to speak, I will not provide a president's report today and move right quickly to the, uh, to the agenda. Okay, thank you. Academic Affairs and Planning Committee report we met this morning. I'm going to ask, uh, I'm going to ask Lori to, to um, come up and, oh, if you knew that, the, the text and the call, you'd understand. <laughs> Four years of high school and maybe he's not going to graduate. Not because of anything he's done, but because of a little minor technicality. So anyway, I'm sorry, we're, we're going to have a very quick um, academic affairs and planning committee report. Yeah, all, you're all groaning, you get it. Thank you. <laughs> Good afternoon, Chairwoman Dininger, members of the board, President Kesselman, colleagues in the audience. We had a very informative meeting this morning on behalf of the Academic Affairs and Planning Committee. I have two information items to present. The Research and Professional Development Grants Committee recommended 34 projects totaling $190,250 in awards. 
The committee also recommended three faculty for course release funds. Award details are presented on page six through 10 in the board book. I am pleased also to introduce to you um, a new disabilities minor at Stockton. Disability studies is an interdisciplinary field of study that examines the meaning, nature, and consequences of disability as a social, cultural, and political construct. It focuses on how disability is defined and represented in society. The minor will be hosted under School of Education with Dr. Priti Haria as the coordinator. Lydia Fechtel was the primary author of the proposal, and this concludes my committee report. Nicely done. <laughs> <laughs> Got to rehearse that one better. That one needs a little more rehearsal. <laughs> okay. Still nice to hear your voices, though. Um, next, Student Affairs Committee report, Trustee Ellen Bailey. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, in the interest of time, I'm going to ask that the Vice President for Student Affairs, Tomasa Gonzalez, give a very brief report on our behalf. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, our committee met, and basically they want to uh, discuss, obviously, all of the business of the semester and uh, the many programs that uh, were performed with students, the events that went on campus, and the good and the bad, and, and we had a really uh, informative meeting. At that meeting, we also um, reviewed uh, the, the nominees for the Distinguished Board of Trustees uh, fellow, uh, fellowships, and I would like uh, Dr. Santana to quickly read their names and that, uh, that of the faculty so that we could save a little bit of time, if you could. Thank you, Pedro. Yep. Uh, greetings, uh, uh, Chairperson Dininger, President Kesselman, members of the board, members of the university community. Um, I would like to uh, acknowledge that since its inception in 1986, we've had 266 fellowships awarded uh, for original research uh, that takes place between faculty and staff. Uh, this year we have uh, students, Jody Davis, uh, project title Low Graduation Rate and Food Insecurity in New Jersey. Uh, the project faculty advisor is Anthony Desen. Uh, can we ask the students to please stand and the faculty as well and to remain standing until uh, I have called all the names and then we will applause. Uh, Caitlin Ewell, um, project title the Stockton University Digitation Project. Uh, um, the project faculty advisor is Dr. Daniel Hernandez, associate professor of biology. Um, the next student is Miss Amanda uh, Karen Arte, uh, the project title is The Use of Wearable uh, Devices on College Campuses, um, and uh, the faculty member is Dr. Akash Taneja, um, Professor of Computer Science and Information Systems. Uh, the next student is Ms. Jessica uh, Kelleher. Uh, her project title is Mathematical Proofs Research, and uh, the faculty member is Dr. Wu, uh, Professor of Mathematics. Uh, Emily uh, Mailer, her project title is Graph Families of Replacement Rules. Uh, Bradley Forrest is uh, the professor, associate professor of mathematics. Uh, the next uh, student is Ms. Stephanie Pert. Uh, project title impacts uh, phytoplankton blooms due to warming and acidifying oceans. Um, and the faculty advisor is uh, Anna Pfeiffer Hebert. Uh, the next uh, student is Ms. Casey uh, Scheider. Uh, the the uh, research is uh, called uh, uh, Mathematical Proofs Research. And again, this is with Dr. Wu, uh, Professor of Mathematics. And the, lastly, uh, the final student is Rajvi Shah. Her project title is um, Girls Who Code Will Make a Difference. And the project faculty advisor is Dr. Claudine Keenan. So um, 
Can we please uh, acknowledge the students and the faculty? That concludes our report. Thank you. Thank you. Next up, Finance and Professional Services Committee Report, Trustee Stan Ellis. Uh, thank you, Madam Chairman. Uh, the Finance and Professional Services Committee met this morning. We had a, a full agenda, including many action items, which are included in the consent agenda in your board book. Uh, they included uh, bid waivers for the upcoming fiscal year all the way up to fiscal 2020. They also included one uh, bid waiver increase, which, uh, which actually is a combination of two bid waivers for uh, the company Elucian. Um, there were academic term fees that were reviewed. Uh, most fees are not changing. There are a couple of uh, increases. Uh, one is for the transportation um, and safety fee. This is going up uh, by $10. Uh, this is being done in part due to the need to uh, continue to improve our shuttle service here on campus. Uh, also will in, is anticipating uh, getting funds ready for the uh, Gateway Campus and having shuttle service available immediately with, with no glitch there. There are also a couple of fees with the SPAD program uh, that are participant fees uh, for audio audiological evaluation, central auditory processing, and a new fee for speech language therapy. Again, those are fees based on participation in that program. Other than that, all fees remain the same. Um, in addition, we, the Finance Committee recommended to the Board approval of housing rents for fiscal 18. Uh, they range from 1% to 3.5%, the average being approximately 2.5%. And again, these fees are based on the supply and demand for each of our housing, housing units. Uh, also in the consent agenda is a resolution uh, calling for continuation of the fiscal 17 budget into fiscal 18. Uh, this is something that we do pretty much every year because we, the fiscal year will end before we know exactly what the governor is going to be doing for us in terms of appropriations. And we, until we know that, it's impossible to really put a budget together for next year. So this allows us to continue spending under the current budget into fiscal 18. Uh, and the final item under that we address today for action by the board is one that we, the Finance Committee enthusiastically supports, which is the um, uh, under the Genocide Prevention Certificate Program. As you know, that's been in place now for a little while. Uh, we did recently receive a donation from Michael Aziz to help fund that program uh, for a cohort of students from an area of tension and conflict as designated by the United Nations. Um, however, his do the donation does not cover the full cost, and so uh, this resolution would allow the board to waive the remainder of the tuition costs for that cohort so that that program could be provided to students in an area of conflict in the world, um, many of whom are impoverished and could not afford this program without the support of uh, this individual and the board. Again, this is all under the consent agenda. Should any board member ask to remove that from uh, the consent, we could do so. But the Finance Committee recommended moving forward on all resolutions. Thank you so much. Do I hear a motion? SFT united can never be divided. 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 Motion. Second. <laughs> Any Second. questions, discussions? I have one comment to make, and that is the last resolution, the tuition rate for genocide prevention certificate cohorts. And we just learned today, it was announced that Dr. Elisa Foji and Dr. Marsha Grossman and their colleague, Victoria Massimino, are meeting privately with Pope Francis at the Vatican this, this. Friday. There's a wonderful press release that Mary Jane wrote about this. Um, and they'll be discussing genocide prevention around the world and presumably this program, which is just amazing, and what an honor to approve this resolution to have this new program supported by Michael Aziz and the university here at Stockton. So. I, I, and I would be, be remiss. Rob, please stand. Rob Gregg has been absolutely incredibly. <laughs> this, does not, this program does not happen without his support. This is truly one of the most significant programs we've ever undertaken. Um, 
it is doing the right thing. And, and we should all be proud of it, Alyssa, and you know, meeting with the Pope. But the, the more important thing is we are touching on individuals who can make a difference in the world that they live in. Uh, and so thanks to all who've been part of putting forth the Genocide Prevention Certificate Program and for your incredible support of us. So thank you, I applaud you, and commend you for it. Thank you. Trustee Dininger? Yes. Trustee Ciccone? Yes. Trustee Bailey? Yes. Trustee Davis? Yes. Trustee Dolce? Yes. Trustee Ellis? Yes. Trustee Valentin? Yes. Trustee Worthington? Uh, yes, with the exception of abstaining in 517024. Trustee Moreno? Yes. Okay. Thank you very much. So next. Audit committee report from Trustee Rachel Cohen. Okay, thank you. So the audit committee has been fairly active. Approximately two weeks ago, we entertained proposals for um, external for the external audit of the college. We do that every three years, and um, <clears throat> we decided to select Grant Thornton, who had been our previous auditors. And <clears throat> this past Monday, we had our official internal audit meeting and heard their um, presentation and start-off campaign. They'll be beginning the audit very, very shortly for fiscal year 2017. In addition, the internal audit department, as we know from the last time I told you, we now have a hybrid internal audit department. We use the external fame firm of Baker Tilly, who has tremendous experience in auditing colleges and universities actually throughout the world. Um, and they supervise our internal audit department and get involved in a number of um, management type audits to better strengthen certain things within the college, not so much giving an opinion on the financial statements. So we we're pleased to get an update through them and they are just starting a new audit there for the college-wide risk assessment program that we have here. That concludes the, the audit committee of the Board of Trustees. Thank you very much. And now we're going to roll you right back into Buildings and Grounds Committee Report because Trustee Leo Schofer couldn't be here today. Right. And I'm happy to report I just got a text from his wife. He's out of surgery and doing well and actually going to come home tonight. Oh, so we wish Leo Schofer a lot of luck. I'd like to turn the Building and Grounds uh, part of the program over to Don Hudson. Thank you. Uh, good evening. Um, I'll make it fast. Uh, we met for a solid hour, talked about lots of projects, specifically Atlantic City's progress going very well. If you've been down there, steel is rising out of the ground, uh, right on schedule, right on the, within the budget we expected uh, with a delivery date still for, of August 1st, 2018. Uh, we also talked in detail about the quad project. Again, you see it out front. It's making great progress. It's right on schedule and will be done somewhere around November 2017, right around Thanksgiving. Uh, the rest of the projects, including arts and sciences, sidewalk projects, restroom projects, uh, a whole deal of summer um, uh, maintenance are all on target within the approved operating budgets, and uh, it'll all be ready for you uh, by September when you get back. Thank you. Thank you so much. So, Trustee Michael Jacobson it was not able to be here today. We're going to go right into the Investment Committee report. Trustee Stan Ellis. Thank you very much. Uh, the Investment Committee met earlier this week. Uh, as you may recall, uh, at our last meeting, we approved the continuation of a relationship with Ashford Consulting and Wells Fargo. Uh, perhaps because of that, they did a wonderful job for us, I don't know, but uh, they both exceeded benchmarks, short-term and long-term benchmarks for the quarter. Uh, so the fund is in very good shape, and at least at the, as of this point, with two months left in a fiscal year, we anticipate not needing to access that fund uh, for fiscal 17, which is also very good news, which will allow that, that to continue to grow. Uh, our next meeting is scheduled for uh, August as part of a quarterly schedule, and uh, we'll report back after that. But so far, so good. Thank you very much. And now to Doc. Now, 
Dr. Harvey Kesselman with University Policies. Yeah, Quick this review. is a con consent agenda. There are three um, university policies that are uh, being offered to the board for second reading as we discussed them previously. And um, is there a motion to approve those three? So, so I'll second. Mm -hmm. Second. Any comments or discussion, questions? All right. Item B, I actually, I'm we, going to. We need to vote. Oh, sorry about that. I was, <laughs> I was anticipating calling on you next, I'm sorry. I apologize. Go on. Trustee Dininger. Yes. Trustee Ciccone. Yes. Trustee Bailey. Yes. Trustee Davis. Yes. Trustee Dolce. Yes. Trustee Ellis. Yes. Trustee Valentin. Yes. Trustee Worthington. Yes. Trustee Moreno. Yes. All right, the next the university policy, this is the first reading, and this is, so, this is one of those historic moments. I want to turn this over to Susan, uh, since I know she and, and, and Maddie and I know Lise and so many others, Lisa Honecker and so many others, Committee. worked on the new mission statement for the university that came out of shared governance. So Susan, if you want to at least provide a little background. Well, as you know, we've been um, having a shared governance committee for the past two years, and many of you in the room are members of that committee. It's represented by faculty, staff, and students, chaired by Maddie and myself. And we've undergone a collaborative process of looking at our mission statement, um, culling it down from a very long statement to a very short statement, but still maintaining our core values. Um, in representing our history, but also being able to look forward. So we're very proud of the effort, but we're really proud of the process. We've had, as you, you know, many of you attended listening sessions. Um, we've gotten input from all, um, all members of the community as best as we could, um, and we really feel like the mission statement is a great improvement. Um, you'll see in the board package that the statement is short, but it's accompanied by vision and values um, that we think that it needs to travel together because it really shows what we are about and it'll continue to evolve as we evolve, but we'll continue to maintain those core values that make Stockton distinctive. Thank you. Since it's informational item, it doesn't require board approval. You will see it again at the next meeting of the board to memorialize our new mission statement. Okay. Dr. Kesselman, do you want to speak about the personnel actions resolution before we vote on it? I, I think, think well, I think we should formally get the motion and then okay. maybe we, we get some folks to identify. This is another historic personnel resolution and I'm pleased that uh, uh, a number of individuals, and I hope uh, that we do it now to recognize the individuals who are being tenured and promoted um, at, this, at this time and structural reclassification. So. Is there a motion to approve the personnel roster for um, this meeting? Motion. Motion. Second. And do I have any questions, comments? Let's... I, I have a couple of um, comments to make. Uh, the two, two shout outs I want to do, and then I'm, I'm hoping after this is approved, uh, maybe the, the provost will come up and others to identify the individuals who are being tenured and promoted today. One is Trish Collins. Patricia Winston Collins highlights she is being moved to the community engagement liaison position. She has served, this is pretty incredible, we have some background here, has worked in our Office of President's Office since August 2000 as Special Assistant to the Chief of Staff and Board <coughs> Liaison. She's played a key role in building strong relationships with the board, the administration, and internal and external constituents. Uh, she knows everyone at Stockton. For those who do not know, she absolutely knows everyone at Stockton and everyone who supports Stockton. She has supported nearly, this is, this, you don't know this stat, 110 board <coughs> meetings to date that she's done. She has her Master of Arts in Organizational Management from Ashford and a BS in Business from the University of Phoenix. She's been an active member of the Stockton community, specifically her work with the Council of Black Faculty and Staff, where she served as treasurer for seven years, then served two terms as council president, and was recently re-elected as president for another term uh, through 2019. She's, been, she's helped to raise more than $300,000 in scholarships. Trish is extremely involved in the local community and has been the recipient of nu numerous awards, um, outstanding leadership and community services from McDonald's Corporation. And another little Trish Collins tidbit is she and her husband before here owned and operated a McDonald's franchise in Washington, D.C. 
Okay. She's the Merit Award winner from the Council of Black Faculty and Staff, and she was, and we were, uh, several of us said. here were able to be there at the 2017 Community Service Award from the Atlantic City and Pleasantville branch of the NAACP. She will be working with Dr. Wilda Colon uh, in community engagement, and on behalf of the President, the Board of Trustees, and the entire Stockton community, I wish to give you, since you're the one who always does this, we're going to give you one. Yeah. <laughs> long. I just want to say a few words. Thank you so much. This means a tremendous amount to me. Um, I have worked in the office of the president for the last 17 years, serving in the capacity um, of working with an extremely talented um, and wonderful board of trustees. Um, so I thank each and every one of you from the Stockton community. Um, you will still see me around. I will be calling you to hopefully get the institution um, overall um, more engaged with community engagement. And again, thank you so much. It's much appreciated, and you guys got me. <laughs> thank you. The next individual I want to introduce, um, I, I sort of warned him that he would have a large greeting as he comes to Stockton today. Uh, he's our new Executive Director of Athletics and Recreation. His name is Kevin McHugh, and he's here with his wife, Bonnie. Uh, we just had a national search that was one of the, the most um, competitive national searches that I can remember in the history of the university. We had an incredible pool of candidates, incredible, Rob, and anybody who's served on it knows what I'm talking about, uh, a pool of candidates. This, this gentleman has his BA in Latin American Studies from Columbia University and his MS in Sports Management from the University of Massachusetts Amherst. While at Columbia, he was a Division I wrestler at 134. He still looks 134, which I'm absolutely <laughs> jealous of beyond belief. <laughs> Um, he was the captain of the wrestling team while there. He, at one period, he served in 20 years at the University College of New Jersey, and you know its reputation for athletics, and he built that program, left there, went to Bates College, has built that program, has the number one rowing program in the United States. He is an incredible hire. I welcome Kevin, Mc Kevin McHugh, and Bonnie, his wife, is with him to the Stockton community. Welcome, Kev. Now you need to vote, and okay. I did remember. <laughs> Trustee Dininger. Yes. Trustee Giacconi. Yes. Trustee Bailey. Yes. Trustee Davis. Yes. Trustee Dolce. Yes. Trustee Ellis. Yes. Trustee Valentin. Yes. Trustee Worthington. Yes. And Trustee Moreno. Yes. Can you? Okay. Dr. Vermillion. Just We're doing it sort it of out of order, just to make sure you do have time. Yeah. I'm very excited to recognize our faculty who have been recommended for tenure and or promotion uh, at this board meeting. Please stand and be recognized when I call your name. From Art History, Amy Papa Alexandro, tenured and promoted to associate professor. From Asian Philosophy, Zhang Bok Yi, tenured and promoted to associate professor. From the Computer Science and Information Systems, Chen Yan Zhu, tenured and promoted to associate professor. From Critical Thinking and First Year Studies, John O'Hara, tenured. There you go, guy. For Mathematics and First Year Studies, Peter Cho, tenured and promoted to Associate Professor. <laughs> Physical Therapy, Lauren Del Rossi, tenured and promoted to Associate Professor. From Biology, Nathaniel Hartman, tenured and promoted to Associate Professor. Chemistry, Pamela Cohn, tenured and promoted to Associate Professor. Environmental Science, Catherine Tredick, tenured and promoted to Associate Professor. From Criminal Justice, Manish Madan, tenured and promoted to Associate Professor. 
from psychology, Justin Ostrovsky, tenured and promoted to associate professor. Social work, Robin Hernandez McConan, tenured and promoted to associate professor. <laughs> from the library, Christy Goodnate, tenured and promoted to librarian two, assistant professor in the library. And from the library, Eric Jeitner, tenured and promoted to librarian two, assistant professor in the library. Many congratulations to all of you. There you go. Give your, yeah, there you go. Thank you. Um, we've got other business listed here, and then we will have comments from the Board of Trustees and from the public. Is there some other business? I'm going to jump right in as we start with comments from the board and then go on to comments from all of you. And I want you to know that the Board of Trustees has received your resolution and I wanted to comment on that. The Board of Trustees is very aware of the current situation. We are not ignoring you. As I said at the end of our last board meeting, every member of the Stockton faculty is important to us. And, I was, and it was extraordinarily important to me in life-changing ways back when I was a student. Personally, I am greatly sympathetic and extremely frustrated with this almost two-year-long quagmire that impacts not only the SFT, but the members of the CWA and PBA as well. Unfortunately, you give us too much credit for having the power to change things. In the two years since I've become board chair, I've had to come to the realization that the Stockton universe is imperfect. And while we work together to identify, address, and sometimes even remedy many issues, this contract issue, which is governed by state law, is currently not one of them. President Kesselman has made it clear that Stockton is unable to respond to your questions. I can tell you that I know firsthand that the president has clearly stated Stockton's position on these issues to several audiences, and I am confident that SFT would support his position. I've had the privilege of being present when some of these conversations have taken place. In the meantime, we are doing what we can. As you know, when approving the budget, we have set aside funds for union and managerial raises. The union set-asides are equivalent to the financial package offered to IFTI, and the managerial set-aside is 2% for FY16 and 2% for FY17, retroactive for this year only, but managers do not receive increments. I'm hoping that progress will be made with negotiation by the end of the fiscal year so that we can move forward. Thank you. Now we open up to comments from other board members and from the public. And the only thing I ask is, given the number of people, um, if we could perhaps keep your comments brief, two minutes or so, and don't be offended if, somewhat, if I start to make noise to just let the next person um, speak if you go a little over that time. So thank you. might take a while. Yeah. And welcome, you, you get more than two minutes. <laughs> um, welcome to our new athletic director. Yeah. <laughs> thank you. Thank you for being yeah. here. Um, I also want to thank Trustee Worthington for wearing the AFT blue today. I think that's important. Yeah. And Nancy, welcome to the board. We're very glad to see you. And President Kesselman, Chairwoman Deiniger, and trustees all, uh, I think you know me by now. 
Um, for those in the audience who don't know me, my name is Ann Pomeroy, and I'm a professor of philosophy, and I'm also the current president of the Stockton Federation of Teachers. Actually, and you may be glad to hear this, this is the last occasion on which I will stand before you as president of the union. As of July 1st, Professor Roger Jackson will take over as president. Roger, would you wave or something? <laughs> Roger Jackson is responsible for all of the organizing this past year. I would be very afraid. <laughs> Each member of the Board of Trustees received a series of questions and answers that led to a resolution. Allow me to explain why the SFT felt that this resolution was necessary. As those entrusted with the duty to oversee the business of the university, we felt that it was imperative for the Board to weigh in on the issues pertaining to contract negotiations. The SFT fully understands that the board does not negotiate this contract, but the terms of the contract have wide-ranging effects upon the university to which you have the duty of oversight. We fully believe that the members' contract negotiations are hanging upon several resolutions that have come from a handful of college and university presidents. At least one of these items is not only unreasonable and irrational, but would result in a massive quantity of administrative work to implement and would be damaging to faculty, to staff, to students, to the entirety of the curriculum and to Stockton University. We certainly do not need that kind of disruption at a time when we're trying to expand in the community. So this is the reasoning behind the resolution we presented to you. The majority of reasonable and good-willed university presidents uh, should not be held hostage by a minority. Stockton's leadership needs to speak out. We need a contract, and we need the terms of that contract to be reasonable for the university's new mission. Furthermore, of course, we need a contract to be fair for faculty and professional staff, and I have in the past made you aware, over and over again in fact, of the fact that SFT members have not received increases in take-home pay for six years, two of those years as a result of not having a new contract. But I'm not sure that you fully understand the impact. So I brought with me today a selection of testimonials from our members speaking to how the lack of contract has affected them. And the frightening thing is that many people said, I want this anonymous because I'm embarrassed. And no one should ever be embarrassed about this except the state of New Jersey. I want to read you a portion of those letters. They are far more eloquent than I can ever be. And I want theirs to be the last voices that you ever hear from me. People know my eyes aren't good and some of these are small, so. I'm, I'm just gonna read selections, uh, but, but it could take just a tiny while. One of the reasons I, this is a full-time tenured faculty member, one of the reasons I was attracted to this position in the state was that it was unionized. The presence of a strong union which negotiated contracts for us, including step increases and cost of living increases, was hugely attractive to me as someone else would be looking after our collective needs and negotiating on our behalf. And they have attempted to do so to the absolute best of their abilities Despite being state employees, they've been treated with profound disrespect by the state negotiating team, empowered by their bosses' union-busting ways and aspirations to the presidency. Need, uh, nevertheless, they persisted. I like that line. But they needed your help, President Kesselman, and the Board of Trustees. As you may recall, the faculty, by and large, supported President Kesselman so strongly that we voted in favor of awarding the President a multi-year contract at a time when we did not have our own contract. Despite providing such an immense show of support, we feel that not enough has been done on our behalf to end the stalemate over our contract. We beseech you to change that state of affairs. You can go to bat for us and relieve the stress and burden of living and working without a contract for a young family. 
to another. With the state wanting to change how faculty are paid for studio and lab courses, I look at my teaching load and I think of how much more I would have to teach each semester. Honestly, that increase in teaching would mean that I could, for the same teaching load, teach at a privately owned studio for the same pay. Now, if we take into account service and all the other faculty components beyond teaching, I could get the same pay for, getting, for doing less work. I'm obviously committed to the institution and to education within higher ed, and I'm tentative at going public with these statements because I don't want people to think that I'm looking at leaving. However, as you are well aware, such a change would make teaching at the university level for what I do untenable. I am one of the faculty members who received a promotion during the time that we have been without a contract. As Dr. Kesselman has noted many times, he did approve promotions. However, those promotions were in name only, as salary increases were not received due to a lack of contract. We're unable to afford, to reference the family, additional money for childcare due to steadily rising costs cost of health insurance. The lack of cost of living increases and the raise I was expecting with the promotion. This has created a lot of unnecessary stress and anxiety on my family. Finally, I'd like to note that I dearly love St Stockton. I treasure my position here, but something has to give. My financial situation is precarious due to an underwater mortgage from property bought before the 2000 financial crisis of 2007 and significant student loan debt. Currently, when I receive direct deposit from Stockton into my checking account, I usually have less than $100 available. Sometimes I run out of funds completely and I have to resort to buying food with a credit card. So just to sum up, these missing step increases are not something that's inconsequential to me. It doesn't represent a surplus to an already comfortable life the difference in salary would make a real difference in my life today and over the next decades. That is from an associate professor, relatively new. I write to you as a non-tenured faculty member who's been at Stockton only a few years. In that time, however, I have published a book, taught over 10 classes with an average IDEA raw score of 4.8 for excellent teacher. That's out of five, by the way and served on 15 program, school, university, and national service committees. So when I say I'm not thriving at Stockton, it's not about my work. When I say I'm not thriving at Stockton, it's about the milieu of frustrated and anxious colleagues. No one can do their best work when they feel it's not appreciated. No one can care for students with abandon when they feel abandoned. I feel alienated by an administration that seems to care more about what corporations we can partner with and what buildings we can buy or build than if their faculty get paid a fair wage. I feel despondent and helpless when I speak with other faculty and staff about how to create change for better at Stockton. I feel like this isn't the place I wanted to work at when I interviewed here. I'm a single mother with a master's degree. This is a professional staff member and a first time homeowner. All of my financial decisions are of my complete responsibility. However, it's the responsibility of my university and my managers for encouraging me to take on student loans and pursue higher education in order to be able to advance in my career at Stockton. Here I am nearly eight years later paying off student loans with no advancement not even any increases in regard to my anniversary or cost of living. I am doing worse now than I did five years ago. The lack of a contract has deeply damaged the atmosphere of my work environment. The faculty's enthusiasm, which was a prime factor in my choosing to come to Stockton 17 years ago, is gradually being replaced with a distinct demoralization. I, for one, feel undervalued and ignored which has created the creeping temptation to throw myself less wholeheartedly into my work. I love my work and want to return to feeling fully engaged in the Stockton enterprise. The willingness to negotiate such fundamental issue as our contract is making that increasingly difficult. Please negotiate a fair contract immediately so I can return to working with the enthusiasm among other faculty who are also vibrantly engaged. 
If I worked for a university in another state, I would be enjoying approximately $10,000 more a year. Such slights are numerous, significant, and make it difficult to justify working here. I have friends with similar backgrounds that work in industry whose starting salary is more than double mine. In 2012, I left a secure full-time faculty position with a private institution to come to Stockton. I took a $10,000 pay cut just as my son was beginning college and our expenses were increasing. The reason I was willing to take this cut in pay was because of the step increases that were in place under our last contract. I'm just now this year making what I was when I left the other job in 2012. Not having a contract has affected our ability to attract qualified candidates to our searches. Since the university has recently received several national and international accreditations, as well as gained university status, candidates currently working for other colleges and universities expect that we will be paying more than their current employer. Experienced candidates who interview for a position at Stockton are disappointed when they receive an offer that is significantly less than their current salary. The dean is not able to match their current salary at another institution, which is at least ten to $20,000 more than the offer they receive from Stockton. When I'm asked by doctoral students and their mentors if Stockton is a good place to apply for faculty position, I'm unable to recommend the institution strongly due to the lack of a fair contract. Specifically, I have to qualify my recommendation by noting how the state government appears anti-faculty as demonstrated by their lack of fair negotiation and insistence on stalling the talks with the union over items that disrespect the value of faculty. At the time of my tenure, I had a conversation with an administrator as I was conflicted about staying at Stockton and that meant uprooting my family to avoid making a three-hour round-trip commute for the rest of my career. I said to that administrator that if I stayed at Stockton, I was making a commitment to further the health of the institution, and that I expected that Stockton was making a similar commitment to me. I was assured that was the case, and have until recently never regretted that choice. This one is very, very long, and I'm just going to give you a tiny bit of background. This is from an adjunct faculty member who was a, uh, uh, a student at Stockton, who then went to Penn, U, uh, Pennsylvania, University of Pennsylvania and got an advanced degree uh, in literary studies. Um, and this individual also is a musician and was in a band for years and toured and stuff like that. And then um, decided that I wanted to return to Stockton. I tired of spending six to eight months every year in a van or on a plane or in a recording studio. Uh, very little sleep, untold hours. It all caught up with me on March 1st of 2014. I was laying in bed watching a movie shortly after waking up and I couldn't find my balance. My lips were numb and tingling. I had double vision whenever I had both eyes open. Uh, my now fiance called an ambulance. I had had two strokes in the brain stem. Doctors told me that either one of them had a 90% chance of killing me. If I weren't, luckily, there's some goes on about the treatment, but if I weren't luckily still covered on my parents' insurance, I wouldn't be able to afford my own, even with the ACA. Not on what I make as an adjunct here. Even with teaching piano, occasionally tutoring, still playing as a session musician, it's difficult enough for me to do all this after my strokes. I put in other applications, but my master's degree often renders me overqualified. Please remember, when the Stockton Federation of Teachers fights for a new contract or better wages or even more opportunities for adjuncts, it isn't greed and it isn't abstract. It's not only a matter of dignity, though it's certainly that. In very real and concrete terms, it's a matter of survival. It's a matter of life and death, the difference between hope and despair, the difference between having a future or being buried in the present that has no place for things like community, fellowship, care or education. We can and must do better. I drunk rights well. Must have learned it at Stockton. <laughs> <laughs>
I give a great deal to Stockton, particularly in terms of my teaching and service to the institution. In 12 years, I've served on countless search committees. I've served on nearly every major campus-wide st committee Stockton has to offer. Further, I recently was awarded promotion to full professor, and although I was quite proud at that accomplishment, when I received the award letter, it felt as if I had been punched in the gut. I could not believe how little the increase would be. I now have two teenagers and an elementary school aged child. I was anticipating a raise that could assist in a growing list of expenses we incur with various activities and school trips. Instead, what I received literally will only amount to one extra bag of groceries per pay period. Honestly, every time I think about the ridiculous impasse we find ourselves in in the state, it pisses me off. I give 120% to this institution, yet I can't afford conference travel or to send my kids to summer camp, largely due to the fact that the state of New Jersey thinks that I don't deserve it. I cannot tell you, I'm oh, sorry, when I came to Stockton, I was hired at a frozen salary. I cannot tell you how disheartening this is. After five years of working hard to help make Stockton what it is, working without a contract leaves me feeling disengaged I feel less motivated to contribute to the university. In working hard, this is another professional staff member, in working hard to receive my master's degree, I knew I would most likely be unable to be in a position such as the one I'm in without it. Like many others, I have student loans, a roof to keep over my family's head, food to provide, utilities to pay, a vehicle to maintain. Life in New Jersey, as we all know, can be quite expensive, so much so that I have, in turn, taken several different side jobs outside the university just to maintain my family's ability to exist. My wife and I both love children. We were recently blessed with the birth of our first child, a beautiful baby girl. We've always uh, also wanted, always wanted to have a big family. To us, that is what life is about. We currently reside in Absecon in a two bedroom, one bath, 786 square foot home, which was a foreclosure when we purchased it in 2011. Despite purchasing a foreclosure, we still have negative equity in our home after six years of home ownership due to the continued decline of Atlantic County's economy. My wife and I would like to have more children, but with the economic climate, my declining salary, and the increasing costs, we've had to reconsider whether or not it is responsible for us to have another child. Given that we are underwater on our mortgage and that my declining income no longer covers our monthly expenses and my wife would be out of work on maternity leave, we simply cannot afford to have another child. This is, um, I worked for Stockton for 18, I've worked for Stockton for 18 years. I got a bit of a late start as a faculty member and I was 40 when I got out of graduate school. And there's some conditions that are listed. I've loved working at Stockton. I guess I'm considered one of the shining lights among faculty. I've participated in and spearheaded numerous important initiatives for the college university. I believe that administrators would universally say that I work my hide off. I'm sharp as a whip, I'm a fabulous teacher, I'm among those considered a must-take professor. As I entered these last couple years, now almost 60, I was looking forward to putting a real dent in my mortgage and maybe just paying it off before I was 70. We were thinking of finally doing some projects in our home. The contract freeze has made all this impossible. We're treading water exactly where we were eight years ago, and it makes me wonder what all this work is for if I can't even paint the rooms in my home. It makes me want to stop being someone else's shining light. What for? It's a slap in the face. I'll have to work till I'm 70 at least. I love Stockton. I hate this state. I hate the way it treats its people. I hate the struggles of my younger colleagues. Who am I to complain at all compared to them? We give our lives to the lives of others. What kind of place is it that spits in the face of people who've done that? It's sick making. I 
think that's all I have uh, right now. Um, I wanted you to hear their voices because I think that maybe uh, you don't fully understand how much of an impact this has had. We've been through three or four extremely difficult contracts with even the cost of living increases haven't kept pace at all with the real increases in cost of living. And so the folks in this room, you know, these folks didn't come out for a party. They came out because we're at the end of our rope. We don't know what to do anymore. And we're not willing to live like this anymore. And as someone, you know, the last person said, <laughs> you know, I, I, I feel the same way. I love Stockton. I hate this situation. Thank you. I would like these entered into the minutes of the meeting, if you would. Thank you, Dr. Pomeroy. And so, um, if I could just ask, uh, if you'll, as you step forward, just um, tell us who you are. And I am you know. Tim Harrison. I'm a member of the SFT, and I'm also the president of the state council. And I'm here today to urge you to respond to these questions. And it's not true that it won't make an effect at the table. It will have an effect at the table if we know the president's positions. Um, at the last board of trustees meeting, President Kesselman claimed to have no involvement in the negotiation process. If that's the case, you should have no problem taking a position on demands coming from the state that, as we just heard, have a dramatic effect on the people who work here and on the operation of the institution. If you have become involved since then, you have an obligation to publicly respond to the positions that your side is taking at the table. All of the members of the council negotiation team are more than willing at any point to defend any position that we've taken at the table publicly. So for the presidents to say they're not willing to defend their positions is the height of disrespect and shows a cowardice, frankly. Um, that's unacceptable. We're not afraid to defend ourselves. I do want to say that I travel around the state to all the campuses. And I think what we're seeing here today from the events taking place now and the previous events that took place at the board meeting is we have a wonderful relationship and a pretty unique, compared to the other campuses, sense of community among faculty, staff, students, and administration. But the positions taken by management are creating a very ugly rift. And this is this action today is just the beginning. It's going to get worse the longer this goes on. And this rift is going to become very difficult to heal. I implore you, please don't let that happen. I respectfully ask you to live up to the trust we've placed in you, give our people the respect they deserve, and answer the very simple questions that Anne has asked in her letter. Thank you. Hello, everyone. My name is Joe Everett. Um, I came here in 2008 as a student out of high school. Um, I was awarded the Presidential Scholarship, which I don't think we give anymore, but that was the full ride, housing and everything. Um, and I'm immensely thankful. Um, I want to tell you that I really love Stockton. Not only um, did that scholarship help me, um, 
I received two bachelor's degrees here. I met my wife here, and we were co-valedictorians in 2012. Um, and now I work here as a professional staff member, and I commute about an hour and 20 minutes each way every day because I truly love the people that I work with, and I truly love this institution. And I know that you all care about this institution very much, or else you wouldn't be doing uh, serving in this capacity. I also know that you are selected for this position or asked, invited uh, to this position because you have skills, talents, um, relationships, abilities uh, that enable you to be effective in this position. That's why you're chosen. Um, thus, I implore you to use all of those gifts and talents, connections, relationships, abilities that you have to help us settle this issue. Um, and don't do it just because I implore you, but I truly believe that you have an ethical obligation um, in your role as members of the Board of Trustees and as the President and whatever other roles might be represented here, um, to do this because ultimately it is about the students. I understand that you love this community and this building and this campus, but ultimately you care about the students, which is what we care about ultimately as well. And uh, I want to just echo some of the things that have already been said, but um, ultimately don't I mean, I, I wish you would do it for us, um, do everything you can for us, but ultimately, it also does impact the students. Um, the students uh, are your primary responsibility, and this is hurting students. Um, if we, as we've heard, cannot hire and, and keep and attract the best faculty and professional staff to the institution, it will hurt our students, and it will hurt the institution deeply. Um, Believe me, as a former student, uh, the faculty and professional staff that I encountered are what made this an amazing experience for me, why I wanted to work here, what pushed me to excel, um, and it's why I would recommend this institution to other people. Uh, if that goes away or that suffers, that is what this institution is all about. Um, that's what makes this place great, our faculty and professional staff and all the other people that make this institution work. Um, that's all I have to say. Thank you very much. Good evening. I'm Emory DiGiorgio. I'm in the School of General Studies. I was also a presidential scholar here. Thank you. <laughs> Tomorrow at the faculty staff appreciation breakfast. I am to be honored for 10 years of service at Stockton, and some of my peers will be honored for 30 and 40 years of service. In my 10 years of service, three of them have been without a contract. I love my job. I love walking into a classroom and helping the most reluctant writers find and develop their voices. I love my colleagues. I feel honored to work alongside my own mentors and teachers as an alumna of this university and community. In the last round of negotiations, when we sacrificed a year of retroactive steps, it was the same year I was tenured and promoted. What seems like a small individual loss in a single year will add up to several thousands of dollars over the course of an entire career. To ask me, to ask all of us, to give up two more years of retroactive steps for work we've already completed, for the time and attention we've willingly given our students, to not reciprocate the commitment we have to them and this university by publicly supporting the union's request for a fair and just contract is disheartening. It is demoralizing. President Kesselman and others have talked about Stockton as a place where one might plant oneself to grow. And I know this to be true. But even the hardiest varieties will falter if they're not getting what they need. Chair Dininger, members of the board, I realize that you cannot deliver us a contract. But you can show OER, the governor, the state, that as stewards of this university, you stand with your faculty and staff.
And tomorrow morning, I anticipate that one of you or a designee will rise to the podium to tell us how grateful you are for all the work that we do. Why wait for tomorrow? Show us today by passing the resolution. My name's Mike. I'm a student here. And I'm angry. I'm, I really don't think you appreciate the value of these teachers. I think if you did, you would be investing more in them than you, are in, than you actually are in new uh, campuses and buildings. They make this school what it is, and people are tired of having to explain that to you. All, you, all of you have the most power to influence those negotiations, but you haven't been doing your part. If not for my teachers, I would have dropped out sophomore year. I have a love for learning today that I never imagined that I ever would, and it's because of them, not the administration, them, that I'm here. And I know a lot of other students who would have dropped out too, if it weren't for the teachers here. Everyone's truly touched that you're excited to see the energy on campus, but it's time to start acting like you care. Pass the resolution. <laughs> Pretty words won't stop us from fighting for our teachers, and it's time to pull your weight because so far, the teachers have been doing it for you. Hello, my name is Michael McGarvey. I'm a professor of art and also I'm a uh, delegate uh, from SFT uh, at the negotiations between the Council of um, State College Locals and the state. Last time we, had, we were here and I spoke, I talked about how public higher education has it's in particular New Jersey, but of course it is uh, in other states as well. But certainly since the Department of Higher Education was disbanded in 95, there has been less and less funding per student until we're at the point where there is very little difference between public higher institutions and private higher institutions. That's not what this college started on. That's not the principle that it was. The principle was to give the public a, an education that was equivalent to or better than those who could, only af who could afford the, the best private institutions. Now that takes funding. It takes commitment. And I'm sorry to say that the push towards autonomy by the nine institutions has in part to blame for the decrease in funding for public higher education in New Jersey. Now it led in the 90s to tremendous tuition increases. I think we're, you're all well aware of that. You've, many of you have been here that long. And then, of course, it has led to, uh, that in turn led to much student debt. Now the only thing I could say in favor for the state is that uh, grants, TAG grants and so forth for students has increased considerably. But the amount of funding, especially over the past few years, has, has, has brought New Jersey probably uh, the 13th you know, to the bottom by 13 in terms of um, the um, decrease in funding per student. That is absolutely unacceptable. And I think that the push towards locals and towards the individual institutions is in part to blame. K through 12 sector has fared much better. They have, a, of course, a, a much stronger presence in Trenton, a continual reminder of the importance of public education. 
And as I talk with my colleagues in these negotiations, and we do talk and we do vote, and I hope that those who signed this agreement, you're all familiar with this agreement, right? You've all seen it, okay? The last agreement that we've had. It says on the cover, I'm a graphic artist, uh, there's, a there's a logo for the council, College Council AFT, which is the council, and there's a logo for the, the seal of the state of New Jersey. Now, of course, it is signed by all of the presidents of each of the institutions, and it is signed by each of the presidents of the locals of each of those institutions. We're all well aware of that, I'm sure. It's the last page in here. I've been very disheartened to hear from my colleagues at other institutions that presidents have been coming to them and recommending that they carry on these negotiations locally or that they would do far better to carry on these negotiations on the local level. Okay, not only am I disheartened and quite frankly very angry at these kinds of suggestions, I have to say to you right now that it is a violation of the agreement. There is only one sole bargaining agent and that is the council. And to suggest, to make suggestions that members would be better off if they started negotiating local, locally is not only a violation of the, of the agreement, which recognizes that the sole bargaining agent is the council, it is also quite possibly could be construed as a violation of federal labor law. This is enough. How much do we have to see how this, this breaking up of all these institutions is harming the public in the public higher education before we start to go back in the other direction and come together to have some coordination between the institutions. Right now, the only major uh, um, group that is representing all the, all the nine state colleges is us, is council. And I'll be damned if I see that, 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 that our council, that our union, and this is the union, okay, all of the colleges, not just the SFT. And I'll be damned if I see that turn around and, and us basically becoming private institutions. Are there any more comments, Roger? I feel like I should speak as the incoming president of the union at my pride in all of you for coming out and fighting for your rights. You're extraordinary people, the faculty and the staff. I'm honored to be with all of you and I can only reiterate what my colleagues have said before. You're on that board because you have power and authority. You're on those positions because you have claimed publicly that what we do here matters. Now is the time for you to step up and show that. Any other comments from the public? We are going to just allow one or two more. Pass the resolution. Do it now. 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 Let me let me just address this, and I'm I'm. This is really important for you to hear. The board, when Maddie began her talk, she articulated. She answered two of your questions. You know that when she said that we set aside as part of the budget pro process the IFTI, what the financial package that the IFTI, IFTI group got. She answered that question. She answered two of your two questions there. The issue that I see, I understand what the issues are very clearly now. And Tim, notwithstanding what you continually suggest, I am now well-versed in what's going on on both sides. Well-versed. I spent a lot of time. Um, I, I do feel the pain which you're articulating. You should know me well enough to know that I do. Two, I agree that there are items on that table that make no sense for this institution. 
I don't know how they make sense for more than this institution, but they absolutely don't make sense for this institution. I have clearly, unequivocally articulated that. So don't worry about whether I am a coward or not. That's not the case. Three, I will do everything that I can from my seat to help bring this to a resolution. And I won't stop until we do. But I have to be bound, as you well know, Roger, you know, and you know, and Tim, you know, bound by law and statute. I know that may not be what you want to hear, but I have to play within those rules. And I am doing all that I can from my side to make some of these issues go away. I can't speak for the financial condition of the state of New Jersey. One of the issues that's being requested, as you well know, is retroactivity to fiscal year 16. That's not an easy lift, even for a governor. And you need to understand that for that to happen, and I've said before, and Maddie has said, and this board has said, we have budgeted for it, but it doesn't necessarily mean it has been budgeted for. Your salary is not the only form of compensation that you receive. You receive pension, health care provisions. You're paying more for both, but you receive it. That's part of formulas that go way back. So what you need to know is this. We are prepared, as we've said on more than one occasion, to match IFTI. We are also prepared, and I have, they can't, get to the to address what I believe is an issue that is very near and dear to you and the one that you articulated concerning the implications as it plays on, on the curriculum. It simply doesn't work for us. That's one of the reasons, and Michael, I truly understand the fervor in which you believe that the autonomy uh, legislation has led to the situation in higher ed. You and I have to agree to disagree conceptually on that, but I respect the position that you've taken on that. Let's do all we can. I think this show of first, the decorum, the manner in which you've approached this, not just today, not just in February, but throughout the process has been nothing short of extraordinary. And as a president, I ought not be here if I would be unmoved by that. So what I continue to ask you to do is be a little bit more patient. This, too, no, no, this, this could be resolved. This could be resolved. Please, I implore you, I implore all of you to have a united front. You want our strength, a united front, not just here. I'm never worried about Stockton's ability to get the faculty to come out, never. You've done it over and over and over again throughout the history of this university. You are a united force. Every campus, if the message needs to be, listen to what I'm saying clearly, every campus has to be as united for that voice to be heard to Trenton. Every campus, not just Stockton. And so your work is not just local. Your work too is statewide as my work ahead of me is statewide. Any other comments from the public? Thank you. The next regularly scheduled meeting of the board will be held on Wednesday, July 5th, 2017 at 430 in the Campus Center, Board of Trustees room right here. Thank you very much for being here today. Can we have a motion to adjourn? May I have a motion to adjourn? A second? Second. All in favor? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Aye.